Okay, uh, as Tonomiri said, I am Omar Abdulaziz, an assistant professor of civil and environmental engineering at Florida International University, Miami. Uh, I have been with this project for the last four years. Uh, I would like to first acknowledge the funding from NOANARS and also from NSF uh, and FIU startup funding that I have used to conduct this work. Uh, before I go any further, I would also uh, want to acknowledge my doctoral student, uh, Khandukar Ishtiak. He has been instrumental to achieve the project goal. Ishtiak, would you stand up so that everybody recognizes you? Here is the title, uh, a model to help you determine your wetland carbon budget and simple enough, right? Understand. And here is the real title. A user-friendly model for predicting greenhouse gas fluxes and carbon sequestration in tidal wetlands. OK, so this presentation would have mainly two parts. In the first part, I will talk about what it is and how you can use it, OK? Not going into mathematical or scientific rigor of that. In the second part, I would, I would talk about how I developed that model. Okay, that would be more interesting, I promise. Okay, so I think by now we know why tidal wetlands are important. But to put in, it in context, let me go through the redundancy again. Tidal wetlands play an important role in soil, soil atmospheric exchanges of greenhouse gas fluxes, a delicate balance in climate, land uses, hydrology, and other ecological drivers determine the role of wetlands as the net source or sink of greenhouse gases. So a user-friendly model is needed to predict the greenhouse gas fluxes and carbon storage from tidal wetlands. Now, what can the model really how can the model really be used? I mean, what is it for? It can facilitate appropriate management of carbon stocks in tidal wetlands and their incorporation in the carbon market. We, we have already spoken about it, right? Market and all those protocols. OK. So now let me talk about what it is. OK. It's a model, we know. But what kind of model is it? The BMW, basically bringing wetland to market, wetland carbon and greenhouse gas model. At this point, you can see that it's pretty long name. So it's a long linear empirical model, as opposed to mechanistic ecological model, you know, which is highly detailed, often over-parameterized. It does many good things, but it's not really easy to use. Okay. So when I was working uh, with the USGS some four years ago, before I joined FIU, I spent uh, on mechanistic modeling of white and greenhouse gas fluxes for a year and a half. And I realized that, come on, there must be another way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so then I was thinking that, OK, how can I use my civil engineering computational background and hydrologic modeling background? And that's what that's how I came up with this idea that how about we go with empirical model building, which is data driven, but with mechanistic insight. Okay. So now the model takes, I mean, it's the final form. The model takes soil temperature, soil salinity, water depth relative to marsh surface, and light as inputs to predict the corresponding carbon dioxide and methane fluxes. But when we started to build the model, we used an, a whole array of variables, possible you know, drivers and participatory variables. But eventually, we were able to reduce it to soil temperature, soil salinity, water depth, and light, basically four, four you know, predictors. So the model estimates the potential carbon storage by upscaling, because we developed the instantaneous model but how, how do we upscale it to, a, to the whole year, for example? So that's what it does. The model estimates the potential carbon storage 
by upscaling the instantaneous predicted fluxes to the growing season. Okay, and also it subtra subtracts the corresponding lateral flux from the vertical flux. Okay, it has the opportunity to do that. Okay, but you will see that later how we manage that. Okay, now the model is presented. Why is it called user friendly? Because I have worked with different kind of model. Most of them has, you know, C++ code on the background, okay, or MATLAB, or if it is a little older, it's a Fortran code, okay. But eventually, I realized that this kind of detailed coding, you cannot just give a code to somebody, okay, like a you know reserve manager. So the concept, okay, that worked in my mind that how about I make it the other way instead of making it more complex let's make it more simple okay so that's how the concept uh, came that we'll develop the model using whatever language okay I, we used matlab okay and then put the model into excel spreadsheet so everybody, so that it's explicit and everybody can use it okay so the model therefore was presented in a simple macro enabled excel spreadsheet file as a user-friendly engineering tool for coastal carbon management without requiring much input data, okay? So how can the model help? So far I have spoken about what it is. Number one, the model will act as an ecological engineering tool to aid tidal wetland restoration and maintenance projects. The model will reduce the cost of wetland carbon and greenhouse gas flux monitoring by estimating them from climate and environmental drivers. The model can predict wetland greenhouse gas fluxes and carbon sequestration under various climate change and sea level rise scenarios. For the third objective, I don't think we are yet at the final stage, but at the current form, the model has the capability, but we would work towards that goal in the future. Okay, so who can use the model, okay? Coastal stakeholders, land or reserve managers, restoration practitioners, different governmental agencies and NGOs. By governmental agencies, I mean it can be state, it can be county, it can be city. Policymakers, and last but not the least, teachers and educators. Okay, like me. Okay. <laughs> so now question is what are the model assumptions okay because when you develop simple models okay relatively I mean even in complex models that only difference is that in complex models you have many assumptions in simple models you have less assumptions okay coastal salt marshes are productive mainly during the extended growing season for example for this New England area based on our data we found that May to October was the high time basically? I mean, that, that's the basic. That's basically the time frame of emission or sequestration. Other than this, you know, it's cold, really cold. Okay, so that's one assumption. Now, methane fluxes for tidal wetlands mainly represent carbon dioxide, methane emissions to the atmosphere. We had some observation where methane was going into the ground rather than emitting. But that was not really the dominant case, okay? So in general, it was mostly emission. So we did, we choose not to model sequestration of methane into the soil, okay? So mod model is specially explicit for tidal salt marshes of Cape Cod area. However, the current model can be extended for similar wetlands of the New England region. The net ecosystem carbon balance, NECB, Jim Tank spoke about it, I mean, other people also spoke about it. That's basically the potential wetland carbon storage based on the vertical fluxes and lateral flux. Okay. So, what? How? How do? How do we? You know, calculate it. It has been represented already. Carbon dioxide sequestration flux minus carbon dioxide and methane emission flux minus net lateral carbon flux. Now, here is the last assumption. That's not necessarily assumption, but you know, I, I, I wrote that these are model assumptions, but not all of those are assumptions. Some of those are guidelines, basically. Okay. The last point is 
that we have option in the model, basically Excel spreadsheet, to specify the lateral carbon flux based on observation. But if you don't have observation, you know, the assumption is that there is no net exchange, which may or may not be true, depending on the system. Okay. Okay, so let's move on. What is the model structure and workflow? Hopefully, okay. This is a flow diagram of the model. You input soil temperature, soil salinity, water depth, and light. By light, we meant photosynthetically, photosynthetically active radiation. And the model will predict wetland carbon dioxide and methane fluxes and then it, all, it will also account for lateral fluxes and give you net ecosystem carbon balance, which is basically the potential wetland carbon storage, okay, for that time frame. Once again, to expand it a little more, we have input photosynthetically active radiation in micromole per meter square per second, water depth relative to the so marsh elevation, soil salinity, soil temperature, and the model outputs are predicted instantaneous wetland carbon dioxide and methane fluxes, net methane and carbon dioxide and methane fluxes over the growing period. Basically, you upscale the instantaneous, and then you compute net ecosystem carbon balance in units of gram carbon per meter square, as well as in metric ton per hectare. Okay. So this is the model structure and workflow. What are the model equations? Some of you might like this. So, okay. So this is the carbon dioxide flux, and it includes both sequestering flux, basically downward flux, and upward flux. Now, how do we predict the upward flux? Basically, the I'm sorry, the, the sequestering flux, downward flux, which is is a function of light, temperature, salinity, and this is a long linear model you can see that temperature is more dominant. We cannot talk like this actually because temperature has different unit than PAR, but you know, from, an, for a, from a matrix of possible predictors, we boil down to only three predictors and that, that gives R square of greater than 0 0.80, okay? Now, we also you know, modeled respiration dominated flux, which is basically upward flux from soil to atmosphere, and we were able to model it only based on temperature, okay? And these are power law model, non-linear model. Now, how do we decide that which model to use? That's basically when photosynthetically active radiation is greater than or equal to 300 micromole per meter square per second. That's, ba that's basically representing the daytime for this New England area, actually, Okayot Bay area. So that represents daytime carbon dioxide sequestration. That's the, the, that model on top. Now, when light is less than 300 micromole per meter square per second, that basically represents nighttime or, cl and, or, or cloudy days carbon dioxide emission. That's basically the model at the bottom. But in the actual Excel spreadsheet, spreadsheet model, you would see that we made this uh, you know, threshold, these are basically threshold flexible. You use your own threshold as appropriate. Okay, now in terms of methane, we predict it uh, as a function of water depth relative to the marsh surface, soil temperature, soil salinity. The, the top equation is when water level is above the marsh surface. The bottom equation, you have the same set of predictors but the coefficients are different and the signs are different. As you can understand, that water level, whether the marsh is inundated or not inundated, it makes a difference in you know, redox chemistry. So we had to model these two separately. But that was not the case for carbon dioxide sequestration. Okay, so I already you know, described what each of this notation means. Okay, so maybe I should move on. Okay, so to, to, you know, to, to present what are the you know, input data guide, how many 
in order to use the model, how many input data you really need, okay? So the first thing is that before running the model, you want to en enable macro in your Microsoft Excel spreadsheet. Uh, the reason is for security purpose, Microsoft by default disable it, okay? You can go to the setup, okay? That's one way. Another way is that whenever you open a, an Excel spreadsheet, it will ask you whether to enable your macros. Okay, in terms of input data, you need at least two sets of input in our understanding. One set should represent daytime average, another set should represent nighttime average. And then you can run the model and you can get a number. Now, our recommendation is that the more the data, the better would be the prediction and estimation. But to get a fair, I mean fairly well representation of your system, you you should take at least six sets of observation to, inco to incorporate seasonal variation. S measurement, num uh, measurement set one and two, basically you take during May and June to catch the beginning of the growing period. One observation for the daytime again, and another observation for the nighttime, okay, or cloudy days. You, you get, you, you get an another two sets of observation three and four, and that's for July and August to catch the middle of the or peak of the growing period, and another set of observation to catch the end of the growing period. So basically, when you when you make six sets of prediction and in, you average it and you upscale it, that should be more representative of your system. Okay. So now, how do we, how do you really measure this? And I'm a modeler. You guys know better than me, huh? In order to set some guidance, uh, you can measure photosynthetically active radiation, okay, it's the fraction of sunlight with a spectral range of 400 to 700 nanometer, usually expressed in micromole photons per meter square per second. You can measure it by quantum, sens quantum sensors. I even don't know what it means. You can look at this, okay. So soil salinity you can use uh, electrical conductimeter, I, I know, kind of know what it is. So, soil temperature you can use digital thermometers, as simple as that. Uh, water level, you can use the stage, okay. So, now, let me see, I don't have the keyboard here, so Kate could help me. I would like to take you to the model interface that I have spoken so many good things about. <laughs> so this Excel model, we named it once again, BWM, Wetland Greenhouse, uh, greenhouse uh, Gas and Carbon Model. Uh, we, gave, we give you a readme, basically, you know, it, it, it sets the ground and it tells you uh, it gives you the background and it tells you what to do and how to use the model, what are the assumptions, and you have a detailed user guide, okay, and there is a flow diagram as well, and uh, Kate, would you, would you go a little down on it? Yes. Yes, lower, yes. So it also talks about global warming potential of methane. You can use one if you don't want to include any global warming potential because this number change really, okay? Or you can also use 34 if you are using 100 years global warming potential of methane. And you can use 86 if you are using 20 years global warming potential of methane. And you can also, in the model you can use 100, 200, 300, all the way to 900 you know, uh, micromole per meter square per second as the threshold to define your nighttime and daytime fluxes. We recommend 300 based on our you know, observational data for the new, for the Wokayot based system and it can be pro potentially ex extended to New England area. And then it talks about what are the model outputs. Uh, let's go to the example. Okay, L let's, let's blow out a little bit on the, on the left. Yes, and let's go to the left. Yes, as I, you know, already described that the first column is unnecessary, but we just, you know, for your convenience, we give it to you. Number of observations, 
okay and and here we use all the observations okay and the second column is photosynthetically active radiation and we have all this data and the third column is soil temperature and uh, yeah there is a little typo here we have to fix degree celsius basically okay this is degree celsius uh, we have another model in, in in kelvin but we choose to keep degree celsius because you know uh, if it is less than zero degree we assume that you know there is not much going on okay uh, then the third column is soil salinity is in parts per thousand then water depth relative to the marsh elevation and that's not difficult to measure then you know you have net lateral flux over the growing period okay you can put your own number whatever is appropriate uh, we choose to use zero because uh, Kevin and Jim Tang were, were not agreeing. <laughs> so that that doesn't count then. Okay. So we uh, actually this assumption is that it's the net washout. What comes in that goes out. Okay. With the high tide and low tide. Okay. So the the threshold value of for light is 300 micromole per meter square per second. And then we give you the option to enter the number of days, okay, you want to upscale it for. In our case, it was 153 days of growing days. It's from May to October. And then enter carbon dioxide equivalent uh, global warming potential for methane. We use 34, but, you know, I'll show you that we also give you option to use 1, 34, or 86, whatever you want. Uh, then you what you do, you basically click on run. You put your data and you just click on run. Would you run? Click on that, please. Yes, it ran. <laughs> Good thing is that I was not embarrassed. <laughs> so, yeah. So the wh what it gives you predicted carbon dioxide fluxes, predicted methane fluxes, and then uh these are all in micromole carbon per meter square per second micromole carbon per meter square per second and then total carbon dioxide sequestration over the growing period we basically take average of this and multiply it by the total number of growing days and then total methane emission over the growing period by considering the global warming potential of methane and we use, you saw that we use 34 and that is the number even by multiplying by 34 the number is only 18 compared to 933 okay and then we say what is the net ecosystem carbon balance over the growing period that's basically this column minus this column minus the lateral flux that we have inputted in this case we used zero so you get net ecosystem carbon balance over the growing period which is in, in, in gram carbon per hectare, it is 914. But if you subtract around 300, you get around 600 gram carbon per meter square per year. Okay? And if you, you know, subtract Kevin's number, it means 100 meter square, uh, gram, gram carbon per meter square per year. So, but I, I, I'm sure that Kevin is going to work more on his, you know, calculus. <laughs> So it will not be, so that I, I don't think it will be that low, okay? So if it is to around 300, then the, the, the sub net would be around 600. And in terms of metric ton per hectare, it's basically a conversion factor, nothing else, okay? You just divide it by 100, that's it. Okay, uh, now I, I just explain, no, let's stay here a little bit, so first, Basically, we have three, three, you know, three uh, sheet in this file, right? One is README, that's the user guide, and then we give you example how to, what are the you know, kind of data for us. We share our own data, and then you, you can run the model, and then this is the actual model for you, and we kept it blank. All the equations are embedded here by coding it in Visual Basic. So you, you don't have to deal with Visual Basic. All you do, you put whatever observation you have in this input table and you click on the run and then you get a number okay so this is where it has boiled to so that was the concept bringing 
in a wetland to market and my concept was bringing science to laymen okay because i am a layman i am an engineer so so okay uh, i think uh, let's go back to the presentation all right so with that i'll go to the next phase example how to use this model again let's say we have two sets of input set one daytime which is basically for us light is greater than 300 and every soil temperature is 20 degrees celsius uh, soil salinity was 29.58 parts per thousand light was 400 1454.29 micromole per meter square per second. Now, water depth in our case was 0 0.07 meter. Remember, we said that you need at least two measurements what one nighttime, one daytime. And excuse us, it should not be set one actually. Uh, maybe yes, it should be set one. Observation one and two, five minutes. I'll do it. <laughs> okay, so and then this is basically sequestration part and this is basically the respiration part you click run you get an output and uh, and then the output is net carbon dioxide sequestration is 514 gram carbon per meter square net methane emission is 0.16 gram carbon per meter square so net ecosystem carbon balance is you just subtract it 514 gram carbon per meter square per year okay uh, and that's basically 5.14 metric ton carbon per hectare. Uh, if you have the fact sheet uh, with you, I just want to correct it. We had a you know, wrong conversion factor, unfortunately. The conversion factor would be just 0 0.01, okay? So now, can you use it for scenario, scenario analysis? Okay, let's say we have a scenario that we will get 1% increase in daytime temperature, 3% increase in nighttime temperature, 0 0.05 meter increase in mean water depth relative to the uh, relative to the marsh level. That this should be WD, it's not RD. So due to sea level rise, let's say one of the scenarios, and 2% increase in salinity. If you run the model, the model tells us that NECB will be Point four hundred ninety four point one eight gram carbon per meter square or four point nine four metric ton carbon per hectare. So remember our baseline. This is a baseline five hundred five point one four metric ton carbon per hectare, right? But this scenario of sea level rise tells us that the you know NACB would be four point nine four metric ton carbon per hectare. That means you are going to get a reduction you're going to basically lose 0.2 metric ton per car uh, carbon per hectare for this wetland compared to the baseline. Okay, so what are the next step? M next step is model generalization because as we have already seen that we used four sites in the acquired base system. It has biogeochemical gradient, but it, the gradient would, would not be as high as if you go to, let's say, Maine, for example or let's say you go to North Carolina. So the next step therefore would be model generalization and the objective is to increase model space and time domain. The model needs to be tested by collecting and gathering more data for greenhouse gas and lateral fluxes and for climate, environmental and ecological drivers. The validation data, data set should incorporate seasonal and interannual variation and include different wetland regimes. This is the key of generalization. You know, you don't necessarily have to go to Florida. If you can get wetland regimes in the closer proximity, that would that should work. Now, model generalization and robustness is the subject of our working proposal. That's basically BWM phase two to be submitted to NOAA soon. Okay. So for any query on this model uh, or methodology or Excel spreadsheet, please contact this following person. I know them. Okay, I can help you. <laughs> All right, so this is the second phase. How much time do I have? Around five minutes? Two minutes, okay. <laughs> Developing empirical models to predict greenhouse gas fluxes and carbon storage in tidal wetlands. That's a more scientific title of this talk. 
So I will talk about this one very quickly. Modeling and prediction of wetland greenhouse gases has been an extremely challenging undertaking. It is still now. Available models are mostly mechanistic, often failing to provide spatial temporally robust predictions. How we develop the model, that's what I'm talking about right now in case, you know, I am losing track. We proposed a systematic data analytics approach. This is what we developed for this project, okay, in the way of, of modeling. So we achieved mechanistic insights and determined the relative linkages of wetland greenhouse pl uh, fluxes with different climatic, hydrologic, biogeochemical, and ecological drivers first. And then we classify and group process variables based on their similarity and interrelation inter patterns. And we use this knowledge to develop parsimonious empirical model, means minimum parameter empirical models to predict wetland greenhouse gases by leveraging the mechanistic insights. So if you're interested, in the first step, we do a correlation structure of all the variables, which could be potential, potential predictors. And then we map interrelation pattern by using principal component analysis. And then we also use factor analysis, which is a supervised principal component analysis. And then we use, we develop partial least square regression. That's basically non-linear regression using power law. And in, with standardized data, the objective is to determine the relative linkages and then you reduce the predictors into minimum okay and then you use the non linear model uh, in the original domain by using newton raphson based you know computational algorithm and these are the variables we started with and i am it's too bad that i don't have time to go through all of this <laughs> i just want to show you and this is my acknowledgement so that's it Okay, if you want to learn more, you can talk about it. Um, so maybe I didn't understand, but is the spectral radiation factor, is that like a surrogate for the vegetation that you expect to find in the wetland? I mean, where are the plants in all of this? Uh, that, that, that is indeed a surrogate of the plants. Uh, we have also sampled biomass data and stem density, stem height, Serena Mosman did that. Uh, but we don't have as many samples to put it into the model, really. Whatever we have, we still try to investigate the relationship between you know, biomass and uh, fluxes. We saw that there is basically no relationship with methane. And there is some relationship, I think a good, good relationship with carbon dioxide, but the data is still small, not comprehensive enough. So we decided you know, to go with the climate and environmental variable, you know, to do the job. And we saw that it did a pretty good job. Uh, I think it, it did an ex excellent job, if I can show you here real quick. Uh, here, uh, if you look at this, the R square is 0.83. The error is, uh, this is called RSR, that's basically root mean square error normalized by standard deviation, okay? The, in modeling domain, if it is less than 0.5, it's a very good model. So it's 0.42. And you can see that this is basically the whole year of sampling for 2013. And you will see that, you know, the model, even though it's the fitting model, is catching up all these ups and downs. That's impressive, you know. It goes from 15 to even less than 5. It's not a harmonic model. It's a non-linear model, but it's a power law, simple enough. But still, the model is catching these kind of variations. So that gave us that gave us the understanding that maybe you know, our objective is minimum parameter model. PAR is actually surrogating the biomass and is 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 doing a pretty good job. So in the future, if we get more data on biomass, we can experiment more. I think maybe the key question is: uh, Do you have evidence that? Uh, this is going to be acceptable to standards making uh, bodies such as Steve mentioned so that it can be used in the process of funding. Well, I, I believe so. We, Steve actually is in our team. So we have been working together for the last four years and every time I presented he was impressed. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, Do either of the Steves want to comment 
on just models and VCS? That's a question. Just want to comment on, on how the VCS looks at the use of models. Sure, so the VCS allows models. Um, they need to be peer reviewed uh, and and really what you have to do as someone who wants to use it is you have to, I mean, uh, Omar showed all the assumptions that went into the development of this model and where it's most appropriate. And so you have to, um, the burden's on you to show, yes, this model is appropriate in this setting, here's why. And, and it's demonstrated that it works and that's what the peer review process would be for. Um, so it is, I mean, our assumption and our hope and our plan all along has been that this model would be linked with the methodology and, uh, and that they would form a complete package that way. Thank you, Steve. All right, so I think that's all we have time for, for questions. Thanks, Omar.